from colonialism, from slavery to colonialism. A short journey in African history and a very tragic journey. It did not end slavery, but introduced a more sophisticated form of slavery. There's a need to define what slavery is, especially in relationship to African people, and then to look at that period from approximately the end of slavery to the beginning of colonialism, another form of slavery. I maintain that slavery, that slavery and Western dominance over most of the non-Western people from the world did not end, trans was transformed, and this, and this transformation, transformation gave, gave a lot of people the illusion that slavery was over. First. Let's look at slavery itself, how it began. Those years between the first appearance of the Portuguese along the coast of West Africa in the 1430s, 1438 to 1442 to be exact, were not years when there were extensive engagements in the slave trade. We need to look at those years and look at the time when the monumental change took place. Europeans were not at first looking for slaves in Africa. They came to Africa principally looking for trade, and some of them were looking for an African emperor named Prester John, who was a Christian. And they wanted to seek his help in their fight against what they called the infidel Arab. Islam and the Arabs and the African armies then dominated the Mediterranean. It had blocked Europe's entry into the Mediterranean for almost 800 years. Now Europe had come out of the period of the Crusades, part of the Middle Ages, the leth lethargy of the Middle Ages, somewhat lessening now. But the African, the Arab, the Berbers had preserved so much that was European culture, or thought to be European culture, at the University of Salamanca in Spain. The Europeans who got this knowledge from the Africans and the Arabs and the Berbers eventually used this knowledge to turn on the preservers. Now that the European had learned again something he had forgotten, longitude and latitude, now that they began to open schools, chart making, map making, seafaring, Europe was still hit by the results of famine and plague and had lost one third of its population. Europe was basically a hungry continent searching for an outlet. And the Europeans had lost so much of the sentimental attachment to other people and to themselves. So now, with the sanction of European institutions, the slave trade began. 
but it did not get underway in, in earnest until after 1492. It was after 1492 in the opening up of the so-called New World that we find the need for a large labor supply. And because the Indians had been either killed off or died off from diseases, it was suggested that the African be used in this capacity. This was a tragedy, of course, for the Africans, considering the fact that there were billions of people in the world other than Africa. So the question arises, why the Africans in this traffic why the enslavement of the Africans as against other people in the world? Why not the Asians? There were more of them. Why not other people? Well, it seems that the African suffered something then that he suffers now. A kind of political naivete. And he had no knowledge of the strangers visiting his land. He began to invite the strangers to dinner. He began to assume that the strangers had the same human qualities that he had. They came as guests and stayed as conquerors. The wholesale murder and disappearance of the people Christopher Columbus called Indians made it a necessity to recruit a new labor supply for the opening up of what is called the new world. So the business got underway, mostly initiated by Spain and Portugal. Then, with the ear of the paper tree, and part was with the sanction This condition continued for almost a hundred years, this Portuguese and Spanish domination of the trade. The Scandinavians entered the trade, had some success, but because the Scandinavian countries were so far away from their base in Africa, they had difficulty being supplied or resupplied. England had a difference of opinion with the Catholic Church and did not enter the trade until that difference of opinion was settled. That difference of opinion was really settled by England adopting Protestantism to create embryo of the Church of England that grew into a great institution. Also with its uh, rationale for being in the trade. Now the trade would last in some form for over 300 years. Starting in the 1400s in the early in the 1900s. This trade would drain Africa of its finest manhood and womanhood, of its finest resources. This is described most graphically in the best known book by the late Walter Rodney, How Europe Underdeveloped Africa. It was no favor to the Africans at all. They were in one of the cruelest binds of history, a bind where they either had to surrender their neighbor or become a slave, 
themselves. In the east coast of Africa, the Arab slave trade had started. The Arab slave trade started 600 years before the European slave trade. Drain Africa of so much energy and organization that Africa did not have the energy and organization it needed to mount an offense against Europe. Another forgotten age in world history. Now Europe has regained her control of the Mediterranean, lost after the fall of the Roman Empire. Europe is on its way to again be a world power. But again to be a world power at the expense of another people. Europe did not have within itself enough resources to change its economic system, to really change feudalism and create the basis for modern capitalism. All these resources came from outside, came at the expense of the African to a great extent. Entire towns were built in Europe, especially England, to supply not only the slave trade, but to supply textiles and bric-a-brac sent to the colonies, sometime in exchange for slavery. The rum business then began to flourish as never before. Now you see the connection between the Caribbean islands, the rum business, the buying of slaves in Africa for rum and sometimes for ammunition. And while England was late in getting into the business, once it got into the business, it was furious and it became a business. It was slave stock on the British uh, exchange. And many of the people that the Africans had protected in Spain, especially the grandees, went to Atworth and found the Dutch East India, the Dutch West India Company. Africa's former friends did not come to her assistance. Africans had no friends in all the world. It was African military might that had stabilized the, the, the Arabs in Spain, in the Mediterranean. Now the Arabs was against the Africans. The grandees were now insurance brokers and founders of institutions that will make its profit on the slave trade. So it continued from the 16th century into the, fifth, into the 17th century. Now, at the end of the 18th century, slavery had reached a saturation point. Had reached a saturation point and had proven to be an unwieldy system of labor. And this system now came under question by the slave traders themselves. They weren't making the profit they had previously made. Now the business would continue another hundred years in spite of their misgivings. But in the 1800s, the middle of the 1800s, the British began to send an expedition out to Africa to look into the possibility of trading in legitimate goods. They wanted to say, we've got something we can offer the Africans, the Africans got something we, they can offer us. Maybe trading in commodities will make us more profit than trading in slaves. But the group that was sent out, the British Indo-African Exploration Expedition, 
lost political power in the interim. Mm -hmm. And the old slave traders took over and continued the trade. But 1807, the United States began to challenge her older relatives. They made a ship called the Yankee Clipper. Now America was not buying all of its slaves from the English to Portuguese. America was now going directly to Africa and picking up its slaves. This interference and this jealousy was part of the cause for the War of 1812. Besides, Haiti had already revolted. Jamaica had revolted longer than Haiti. And the system itself was in danger. The British abolitionists Wilberforce, Granville Sharp, later Clarkston, had emerged. They were preaching against the system of slavery of the African, but they did not preach against the exploitive system of child labor in England. Nor did they sponsor a single piece of social legislation in England improving the lot of the British working class. So the, the, the abolitionists were somewhat questionable in their sincerity. All right, now, the Africans had begun to mount resistance against the system at this time. The massive slave revolts in the United States had already started. The slave revolts in the West Indies started a hundred years before. Now they had something to deal with. The British outlawed traffic in slaves at sea. 1807. On 1830 or 35 or thereabouts, the British began to eliminate slavery in some of its colonies. The elimination of slavery in the West Indies is highly open to question. Open to question because many of the slaves freed from the plantations now having to take care of themselves, now having to feed and house themselves, eventually returned to the same plantation where they were slaves knowing no other labor, and hide themselves out for pittance. And the planters got the best of the deal. And so slavery really continued in a transformed way as against a more brutal chattel way because there was no place for a slave to go to seek employment, to feed himself. That vine existed both in Africa, Caribbean islands, and in the United States. In about the middle of the 19th century, the uh, Moret Bay concern, in fact, there were several kinds of revolts in different parts of the island, but mostly in Jamaica, where most of the Caribbean revolts occurred. The early revolts in Cuba. Now, these revolts and the disappearance of the British craftsmen had created a Caribbean free man. And the Caribbean free man now made contact with the African-American free man in the United States, especially those in New England. The winters in New England were long, and to pay for a slave all the year round just to have his labor for six months wasn't profitable.
So the slave began to buy his, 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 his freedom. The industrial slave developed. And he became a chips corker of well of, of, or an industry at that time who, in wooden ships, masons, carpenters, basic craftsmen entering the embryo of American industry. But the great turning point would take place 1884-1885 when these European nations who had been doing errands for the colonialists began to have colonial aspirations. The King of Belgium had spent considerable money in his extracurricular activities. Belgium, not a particularly rich nation, began to look around for something to exploit. At least the king did. All of this brought about the Berlin Conference, 1884. Mm -hmm. Now the Berlin Conference is meeting. The two dissident nations without colony are now making a claim. Germany and Belgium. Belgium in this conference dealing with breaking up the rest of Africa still not free Belgium would get the Congo, mm -hmm. now called Zaire. Germany would get four big pieces of Africa, part of the Cameroons, Togo, Southwest Africa, and the country we now call Ten. Ten Tanzania. Now, <clears throat> with this partial satisfaction, the French had taken over large areas of, French, of what is now what would later be called French Equatorial Africa. And the French would now consolidate the pieces of that empire into one. The British would move around to East Africa ostensibly for the purpose of stopping the Arab slave trade. But what the British did was to establish themselves and to make peace with the other colonialists and introduce colonialism another form of slavery mm -hmm. more sophisticated than the form of slavery. Mm -hmm. Now South Africa is being settled by the Boers who are the Dutch who came there in 1452. Now they began to push the British. The British began to push the Zulus and the Zulus began to push back. Now you've got a war on your hands. You've got several types of wars. The Zulu is trying to consolidate Africans in order to save Africa for itself as against European rule under the leadership of, of Chaka. As we come down to the end of the 19th century, it, chattel slavery is turning into colonialism. Now, no slaves were taken out of South Africa. In South Africa, they would enslave the entire population on the spot. They would take the trees and the mountains and the fields and the cattle. This would start a series of wars at the Cape with the Cochon 
Cochon people, are the Cochon speaking people that the Dutch call Ha Ha and Bushmen. And after this, the Zulu wars of consolidation would last into the 20th century, the last war being 1906. But those wars all over Africa signaling the end of one form of slavery, called slavery, in the beginning of another form of slavery called colonialism. But colonialism would launch a brutal war against African culture, African ways of life, African gods, anything African that made the African feel proud of himself as a human being. They would change his religion, change his language, change his clothes, change his point of view on the world. And then they would have him in a vine worse than a prison because they would have imprisoned his mind. Yes. And African people at this juncture began to mount some kinds of campaigns that ultimately would lead to independence. Mm -hmm. In the United States, Booker T. Washington had emerged of a whole concept of nation laws, manhood and womanhood dignity would assert itself. Not only through the Booker T. Washington period, but through the life of W.E.B. Du Bois, radical journalist T. Thomas Fortune, William Monroe Trotter, we were mounting an offense a world offense among African people against this uh, change of, of system. And then we had less illusions than we have now. Yes. Bishop Turner fought not only the system of the aftermath of slavery, but the betrayal of the Reconstruction when promises were made and not kept, no 40 acres, no mule. We were in a period which Professor Rayford Logan called the Nadir, the darkest period in our history. In the Caribbean, they're beginning to fight for constitutional government. In Africa, the embryo of the fight for independence had already started. And all African people all over the world entered the 20th century fighting the aftermath of slavery and realizing that colonialism was another form of slavery. And they came fighting, bleeding, and hoping, but not surrendering into the 20th century. We have Dr. Clark, how many nations were involved in the Berlin Conference that divided all of Africa? Germany, Belgium, the United States involved. It's about 11 nations uh, who would admit they were involved, but really, most of the nations of Europe with territorial ambition were involved. All of the colonial nations, France, Portugal, Spain, was directly involved. There were nations indirectly involved, like the United States, who kept pretending that it was not uh, involved. How did it come about? I mean, European nations just decided 
they wanted to divide Africa? No, you see, the imperial nations that had cut a bigger piece of the pie than others thought they deserved had to pay attention to these large European nations like Germany and Belgium mm -hmm. now asking for a piece of Africa and France that didn't think it had enough and France ended up with the largest piece mm -hmm. but the Belgians ended up with the richest piece Asking the question at this time. Yeah, that's what so, I mean. so at this particular time, Africa, Africa as a nation was a broken nation. It, it was, was a broken already. nation and nobody was asking Africans permission to do anything in Africa. Mm -hmm. Gold had already been discovered in West Water Strath by the British thief Cecil John Rhodes. Mm -hmm. They'd already uh, driven off or killed off the Africans who objected, especially Logan Gullah, and killed him off to take over the area that was later called Southern Rhodesia, Northern Rhodesia. So the African was in a bind, and he got into this bind because he did not understand the nature of Europe's intentions in Africa didn't understand it then, don't understand it now. The states of uh, Mali, uh, Ghana, uh, Sangay, the powerful states of The Africa, old independent states. Were they still, did they put up resistance? Were they still... But, but they were destroyed by an invasion. Now, Ghana was gone by now, by the time of the invasion, and so was Mali. But the independent state of Sangay, larger than the territory of the United States, was destroyed by an invasion from Morocco. Mm -hmm. uh, Arabs. Arabs. Muslim against Muslim. Because mm -hmm. that state was Muslim when it was destroyed by other Muslims. Mm -hmm. A fact which a whole lot of African scholars are not willing to face to this very day. Mm -hmm. So the Europeans did not participate in that invasion? Yes, they participated as mercenaries. So then with both Europe and the Arabs? Well, the Arabs they... hired the Europeans. Oh, okay. I see. Because they could handle modern weapons of that day. Mm -hmm. Now we're talking about modern weapons, so we're talking about um, the gun. Gun. And later the gas gun. Guns in small cannons. Guns and small camp, which the Africans did not have. Did not have, but the African, the Amasangi had never known defeat three or four hundred years. And when they got wind that this group was coming across the Sahara, they sent a sufficient force out to meet it. Mm -hmm. More outnumbered it. But the Africans didn't have any guns. So the gun was the turning point. The gun was the deciding point in the fall of the empire. Now the Arabs, Berbers, Europeans, whoever else they had in this motley crew of invaders, mm -hmm. they literally destroyed the great educational institution, the University of St. Corey, mm -hmm. four years after they were there, 1594, Invasion occurred in 1591. They exiled the great scholars, mm -hmm. including the great master scholar Ahmed Baba. Mm -hmm. So, if we're talking about this period, an African um, civilization would have been compared to European, if not greater than European, in terms of its education. The its Western history. Sudan had an educational city in addition to a great university complex at Timbuktu, the University of St. Coley, whose standard, standard was so high that many times Arabs came down in the Western Sudan seeking jobs as teachers who were not qualified. 
and Akhmi Baba, who wrote 47 books each on a separate subject, wasn't trained any place except inside of West Africa, called the Western Sudan. Mm -hmm. Didn't go to Europe, didn't go to Western Asia, didn't go any place except Africa. Mm -hmm. And some of these works still survive to this very day. He wrote a book on Arab grammar that's obtainable. Mm -hmm. And he tried to tell these Arabs, we're your co-religionists, we're your, your kin and faith. I know, we're Muslims too. Mm -hmm. And just slaughter them. Pay no attention to it. This not only was a tragic event in the history of Africa, it was a tragic event in the history of Islam. 